Welcome to Shooting Straight with A1F.com. I'm Frank Miniature, the Editor-in-Chief of the NRA's America's First Freedom. Today we're speaking again to Stephen Halbrook. Now he's a, an attorney, an author, uh, his latest book, author of 10 books, his latest book, The Right to Bear Arms, A Constitutional Right of the People or a Privilege of the Ruling Class. Fantastic read. I, I learned a lot from that, Steve. But today we're here to talk about, you wrote a feature for us, a cover feature, on this, this New York State Rifle and Pistol Association the Supreme Court case versus Bruin. Where I'd like to begin is, what does this really mean for America now? Which is the big question we asked at the beginning of the feature. How is this going to reshape in, 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 the, in the few states that still had May issue, but in other ways? Hey, Frank, good to see you again. You know, it's been a long time coming. When the Second Amendment was adopted in 1791, there really weren't any controversies about it. The right of the people to keep and bear arms should not be infringed. And then uh, um, a, a nice philosophical gesture to the militia concept. And in 1791, St. George Tucker wrote the first commentaries on the Constitution. He said, look, the Bill of Rights is written in a way so regular people can understand it. It's not just for the government to interpret or misinterpret. And the American people have always known that the right to bear arms means the right to bear arms. And they've always known that the people means the people. And so now the Supreme Court finally writes the definitive opinion telling us what we know already, but which has not been known in many states. In fact, uh, six states specifically, uh, six of the most populous states, uh, New York, California, and the other usual suspects. So... What the Supreme Court does is to knock out the uh, proper purpose clause in, in New York State's licensing regime. So they had to determine that you had a proper purpose, but the proper purpose is not self-defense. In fact, the way proper purpose was administered, like New York City, uh, if you were a billionaire, a celebrity, or maybe you paid the right bribes, you could get a permit to carry a firearm. Otherwise, forget about it. If you were just some working slop, you know, like you get off at midnight, you got to go down to the subway and get home, and you don't qualify for a permit unless you had specific information that this coming Thursday you were going to be attacked by a known assailant. So that that's the what the court basically holds, that the the— People who uh, administer licensing provisions of uh, state laws uh, regarding the right to carry firearms cannot decide whether you have a need for self-defense. Uh, you have a constitutional right to bear arms, and that's good enough. They can certainly check your background. They can require training and other things like that, but they're not um, allowed to decide if, whether you should be able to exercise your Second Amendment rights. But the proper purpose, it was up to the licensing official. It was discretion. In upstate New York, a county, a, a local sheriff might decide, okay, you know, uh, self-defense is, is a valid reason and we'll give you a permit. Whereas New York City or any other jurisdiction that had may issue uh, a law in place could just decide, I'll give it to these elites, which is what they did, or we'll give it to some people uh, who unfortunately were able to bribe some licensing officials, which did happen. Uh, they might do that. But it was up to their discretion whether they could take away a part of our Bill of Rights or not. And the Supreme Court said, no, you can carry this freedom outside of your home. Right. And now there's broader ramifications to the case. Um, Justice Clarence Thomas wrote the opinion. It's, it's very lengthy. It's very definitive. And it discusses how Second Amendment rights are to be interpreted. And what it does is to talk about the importance of text I mean, that's a no-brainer. The text of the Constitution, the text of the Second Amendment being the primary thing we look at. Uh, and besides text, our history and tradition. And the history and tradition that you look at, most of all, is what kind of history was there in 1791? Uh, were there any regulations? If so, what were they? And so the, the kinds of regulations they might have had then are permissible today. But if they didn't have regulations of that type, and there's no analogy to any of those regulations, then new ones that are invented today are, are invalid. Let's be more specific. For example, um, th there some states had, and colonies before they were states, had 
uh, a common law offense or a statutory offense of, against going armed in a manner to terrorize others. Nobody would quarrel with that. We don't want people running around, making threats, pointing guns at people, you know, frightening people. Um, but peaceable carrying of firearms, that was valid. Uh, the court also looked to the early history, the early republic. And as a matter of fact, um, a small number of states, mostly southern states, enacted laws uh, prohibiting the concealed carry of firearms. And uh, other than one exception, the courts upheld those. So the, the Supreme Court decision then basically is compatible with the idea that you can restrict people from carrying arms in a manner to terrorize others. You could restrict concealed carry, although most states today um, – perhaps find it preferable that you carry concealed and they provide for permits to do so. Um, and perhaps there could be other analogies like about sensitive places where guns could be banned, like a good example would be courts. Um, they didn't have sterile areas of airports then, but that's another example of, of a permissible sensitive place. They screen you and they have armed guards to protect you once you get into the screening. It's the same with courts. Um, we haven't really caught up to the, the curve with schools, though, um, based on some of the tragedies we've had. Some schools now have uh, armed teachers or otherwise armed officers of some kind, and that's really, if they want to declare that a gun-free zone, that's what they need to do. But in any event, there are sensitive places where uh, guns cannot be carried, and we do have some uh, narrow examples of that at the founding. And, and so the court goes through all of this English history and, and discounts a lot of the history that New York tried to throw at uh, the court, like, uh, oh, you can only uh, carry a gun with the, the king's license. Like, we got rid of the king a long time ago. Get out of here. We had a revolution for that, right. It's an originalist interpretation. And I think we lose people when we say originalist, though, so I'm careful about that. It's, this is the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, known as the Bill of Rights, passed by the will of the people, ratified at the time by the states. So it was the will of the people that wanted these in. It, it was a prerequisite to actually signing uh, or agreeing for the states to ratify the Constitution itself. Said, we need this Bill of Rights put in. And they said, okay, legislatures agree, and the first Congress did this. So this is the will of the people. And if the will of the people want to come in and amend the Constitution, which has happened in the past, not easy to do, but it's happened, there is a process for that. So that's what Clarence Thomas is looking back to. And I mean, the quotes from this, and this is... And it's, an incredible opinion. I mean, here's Thomas. We know of no other constitutional right that an individual may exercise only after demonstrating to government officers some special need. <laughs> Does someone have to go and say, I need this religion. I, I, can I please practice it? No, of course not. Yeah, and what's incredible, of course, is they didn't give out permission too much. They were very stingy. And so most of the time, uh, you want to exercise your right to religion or assembly or against unreasonable searches and seizure. No, you can't do that. You want right to counsel. No, not unless you're some kind of exceptional person. So, um, yeah, I mean, that even came up in oral argument. And, and even Justices Kagan and Sotomayor were pounding on the New York City or the New York State attorney asking, um, is there any other constitutional right like that that you have to get permission to exercise it? And, of course, uh, it was a blank stare. I mean, the answer is no. <laughs> no, and, you, and you're right in this article for America's First Freedom. Uh, and, and this gets to a little bit of the weeds of the thing, but this is, this is critical. Uh, to get around this clear ruling, lower courts invented a second balancing test to deconstruct the right to uphold each and every restriction, also called intermediate scrutiny. It was nothing more than a version, uh, a version of the deferential interest balancing test. Uh, Stephen Breyer advocated in Heller, but of course was overruled in Heller. It was, it was a minority opinion. So... At the level of scrutiny, uh, Justice Thomas, the majority here, uh, addressed quite clearly. Can you explain that? Yeah, I mentioned text, history, and tradition. And what the court rejects, however, is intermediate scrutiny. And as a matter of fact, virtually all of the lower court decisions upholding restrictions do so on the basis of this balancing test. Here's the government interest and overcomes the right to keep and bear arms. Um, and the court totally rejects intermediate scrutiny. It, it, it um, pulls the rug out from under all these decisions that uphold so-called assault weapon and uh, magazine bans. Um, another th thing the court put in as far as the sensitive places go, you can't declare all of Manhattan a sensitive place. 
Right, so, he said that. I mean, the ruling. litigation has already started up. New York has already passed a law. Um, no firearms in public transit. No firearms in the subways. No and, firearms and in churches. No places. firearms in any public gathering. It, it specifically says if you go to protest for a civil liberties, a civil right protest, you can't go armed. An outrageous list. Yeah, and and if you want to know what the uh, state really thought was a sensitive place, look at what the law was before this decision came down. The sensitive places that even those who had permits had to abide by. They were very narrowly defined. They were government buildings, police stations, prisons, schools. Um, but but it did not include all of these uh, other areas, you know, parks, um, public gatherings, um, you know, public transport, all of that. So there's a bad faith effort underway already um, in, in New York and California and maybe other states to uh, basically, New York is playing the role of the Empire State Strikes Back. Um, right, and it's a felony, up, gonna... to, up to 10 years, a possible jail time, a felony, if you carry in one of these areas, which is easily, if a person carries, as I do, you could easily walk into one of these places without knowing it, a sidewalk, and suddenly there's a protest there, or, or what have you, and, and suddenly it's a, it's a potential felony where you could lose your rights for life? It's a felony to go into like a store, unless they have a sign up saying, oh, we welcome gun owners here. That's just an attempt to cancel those stores. And nobody's going to want to do that because they know that the mob will go after them. Um, and that's a fir that and some of the other things, that's a First Amendment violation. That's coerced speech, basically. Um, they have the reference in the existing laws to good moral character and the... Um, Attorney General of California has already started talking about, oh, we're going to look at your um, your social media. We're going to determine if you have any hate speech, speech or racism. And, and what are they going to look for to that? Like uh, a hate group known as the Southern Poverty Law Center. They identify what they call hate groups, but I mean, they're a hate group themselves many times in, in the way they do this. So the, there's um, the floodgates are going to be open to all kinds of new litigation, unfortunately. And New York State as well, you have to give them your social media handles so they can check up on you, which I mean, the first, my first reaction to that, is this going to be a political test? Is this licensed official going to look at this and go, oh, I don't like the party affiliation of this person. I like what they're saying uh, as far as this political uh, opinions go. So I'm going to deny this person their right to bear arms. Yeah, like if you want immigrants to come here legally, does that mean you're a hateful person? You hate immigrants. I mean, you, you, have, you have no... There's no limit to the mischief that can be done with what's uh, going on now, the response. I mean, it's it's the same kind of nullification or massive resistance to like happened in 1954 to Brown versus Board of Education. Court said uh, you got to desegregate the schools. That's what the Equal Protection Clause requires. And now the Second Amendment requires you to let people carry. Well, we're going to do everything we can to stop it. This happened right after uh, Heller came down. D.C. made it harder on gun owners uh, than ever before. We litigated that in cases called Heller 2 and Heller 3. We, we won some of those uh, provisions. We got some of those provisions knocked out. But make no mistake, New York and California and some of the others, they're, they're going to just come back with everything they can. You just have to keep fighting them. So this is really a new phase. We, we've, we've gone through now the Bruin decision. Uh, we do have a right. It, it obviously goes outside of your home to, to bear arms. Uh, but now what's a sensitive place? And this whole battle and just gets to another place where people have to still stay involved. Uh, you know, please uh, keep your NRA membership active and so on, because this is an important phase now of this fight for freedom. Yeah, I mean, it's not like all the walls of Jericho just tumbled down. Um, they're building new walls already around your Second Amendment rights. And, um, you know, this goes back to the dawn of humanity. Um, Plato and Aristotle discussed, debated whether there should be an armed people or should there be an elite that uh, monopolizes arms. Tyrannies always disarm the people. Uh, it's a pendulum throughout history that goes back and forth, and it's always happened that way, and it'll be that way forever. So as long as there's humans, there'll be some humans trying to um, gain power over others and to oppress them. That's what the Second Amendment's there for. It's to 
so that in, in the last resort, the people will have arms to defend themselves with if there's tyranny. 44 states allow people to carry arms, law-abiding people. Uh, the sky ha didn't fall in those states. It's not going to fall in New York or California, or New Jersey, uh, or Maryland. And so um, this is normal. Uh, and you have a right to carry arms. You have a right to defend yourself personally. You have a right to defend yourself from um, you know, robbers or groups in the case of riots and um, where they're trying to burn your, your house or your store down, you can use deadly force. And in the ultimate um, analysis in terms of um, group defense, we have a right to, to defend ourselves from invasion, from domestic tyranny. So, uh, and, and hopefully we don't, we'll never have to do that. Um, but th those are all intended to be the purposes. Um, we, we don't just, you know, um, like when when seconds count, the police are minutes away, and and now they're they might be hours away, or they might tell you they can't come because there's a riot going on, like happened in 2020. So this is one of the ultimate rights of the people, one of the ultimate rights of self-preservation. Well, we should say here right at the end, this is a really big win for freedom. It's a win that. A lot of people have been behind for a long time, have been pushing for for a long time. The Supreme Court turned down cases that could have gotten us here uh, over the last decade and more. And, and we're finally here. And OK, we're entering a new phase of, of the battle, especially in certain states. But it's a big positive thing. Do you feel positive about it? Do you think that we're, we're entering a new uh, realm of freedom as so many more millions of gun owners have, have uh, millions of people have become gun owners? Uh, and now this decision, do you, do you feel positive about it or how do you feel about this? Well, it's extremely positive. Justice Cl uh, Clarence Thomas, I think, is one of the greatest justices of all time. And he's written just a, a, a perfect opinion. Um, we had a, a concurrence by um, uh, Justice Alito um, criticizing the dissenting opinion by Justice Breyer. Breyer wanted to talk about blood on the streets and murder and everything like that. And and, and the response to that is, what does it have to do with the constitutional right? In fact, it proves we need to exercise this right. One of the examples that Justice Breyer used in his dissent was the, the shooting at the grocery store in Buffalo, New York, where they had exactly the kind of laws that, that were called into question in this case. Um, Justice uh, Kavanaugh, joined by Chief Justice Roberts, wrote a concurring opinion completely agreeing with the majority opinion, as did uh, Justice Amy Coney Barrett. And they, they all added their two bits, but um, it, it's really a, a, a perfect decision overall. Um, I'm just delighted with it. And I think uh, we all have to look forward to the next steps and to continuing to move this um, constitutional right forward. Absolutely. Uh, so Steve, where can people find, find your books, find out more about you? Um, well, I have a website, stephenhallbrook.com. Um, just Google my name, Stephen Hallbrook, and Right to Bear Arms. Uh, you'll, the books are on Amazon or wherever you want to buy books from, uh, online or wherever. Um, uh, I do have an Instagram account. It's just, it's, I think it's just S.P. Hallbrook. I'm not very techy. So um, <laughs> I was going to say you're braver than I am, an Instagram people account. People ask me, how can you follow me? Like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> so. Um, anyway, if, if you're interested in the topic, my book, my latest book, the, the right to bear arms, um, you'll see a good bit of the research appearing in the Supreme court decision. Some of the, um, old English cases are, that are cited, I, they were cited for the first time in my book and, um, some of the reconstruction history, different parts of the, the opinion, the historical parts in particular, you'll, you'll see covered, uh, at greater length in the book. Thank you, Steve. Glad to do it. Thank you, Frank.